Homes Development at 4500 North Prospect Road, Tuesday, September 6, 2016. The meeting is now called to order. Madam Clerk, would you please call roll? Trustee Harn. Trustee Carter. Trustee Mariscal. Present. Trustee Cumming. Present. Trustee Reichert. Present. Trustee Fuller. Present. All right. Thank you very much. Basically, what we're going to go over is uh, a little bit more of the uh, meat and bones of the of the agreement for the proposed development. And to start us off, on a fine foot. What's that? No, we'll do that the next week. Uh, throw it over to Administrator Fick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> so I know a lot of you are kind of trying to scurry through these documents here as, as we're um, just getting them handed out. So I've gone through it, and um, not that there's not other things that you might want to pull out of here, but um, I thought we could kind of go through it. I've got the highlights, you know, that I've tried to cull out here a little bit. So um, on page, and the page numbering might be a little bit off because I know this was revised here at the last minute, but uh, looks like page... 30, page three, possibly page four, I'm trying to find it here. It talks about that the, uh, the, degree, the development agreement obligates the developer to construct a multi-use commercial and retail uh, facility in adjacent parking lot, including a minimum of 39 public parking spaces. Um, on page four, it says, Village shall reimburse the developer for its TIF eligible project costs and BDD eligible costs, an amount not to exceed uh, 1.8 million. So I know if this, if anybody has any questions or this sounds like something we didn't talk about before, let me know, because as far as I know, this is all stuff that we've talked about uh, previously. Um, also on page four, it talks about the village shall convey property owned by it located at 4500 North Prospect Road, which is the former uh, gas station site. Um, and then there's some definitions. Then we go over to page five, and it has the developer agreeing to complete the project on or before December 31st of 2017. So that's the time frame they have to get everything finalized. Um, page six talks about the various loan uh, obligations that they have to meet. They need to get a private equity funding in the amount of not less than 400,000. Debt financing through a commercial bank of not less than a million eighty thousand, and then SBA financing in the total amount of seven hundred twenty thousand dollars. So, those are all developer obligations. Um, page seven, we get into the incentives. Uh, again, one of the incentives is the conveyance of forty five hundred North Prospect Road uh, for the amount of one hundred eighty thousand dollars, which was the amount that um, we purchased the property for. And as we talked about before, we, we have a uh, contract for deed on that property, so we need to pay it off essentially so we can convey the property. So uh, the village is obligated to secure uh, a loan in the amount of um, $147,000 uh, to pay off the uh, contract. And it's amortized through the year 2023. And we our loan payment comes from the sales tax that is generated from the project. So when we get into the shared sales tax uh, component, you know, the village does retain 28.9% of the of municipal sales tax figures other than BDD. So if that 28.9% of the sales tax that we receive in any calendar year does not meet our loan obligation on the $147,000 loan, then we can start to Go into go to other um, and rather than reimbursing the developers, we can start to take that money out of their portion of the sales tax. So essentially, uh, the project pays for um, the property by generating sales tax that um, we have, you know, first and position on up until the point our loan is paid. Uh, also on page seven, it requires the village to provide a no further remediation letter to the EPA from the EPA, which we have done. Um, so that's been satisfied. Page eight uh, talks about reimbursements for TIF eligible project costs. So um, we talked about this as well that um, 
our, our advisor advises us to rely on the property tax component of this project to provide back the incentives versus uh, leaning more heavily on the sales tax because the village can use sales tax for multiple multiple uses. So this is structured to where 100% of the net uh, incremental increase in real estate tax generated by the development uh, goes back to the developer from the years 2019 to 2028. So when it says 100% of the net, that's really about 75% of the real estate tax generated because of the intergovernmental inter agreement we have with the schools where we, we you know, reimburse them or keep them whole for any uh, money they might have lost because of the TIF. After 2028 through 2039, which is the life of the TIF, then they would receive 94% of the net, net increased uh, real estate tax generated. Also page eight talks about the business district revenue. Um, 100%, and that's a 1% sales tax, um, and 100% of that would go back to the developer from the time period of 2018 to 2023. After that, the village retains 100% um, of that for the balance. And the other municipal sales tax, which includes uh, food and beverage, state portion, and the home rule tax, they receive 71.1% of that um, from 2018 to 2022, and then 75% of that from 20 for the year 2023. And then again, after that, 100% goes to the village. Page nine talks about the designation of public parking. Again, they agree to designate a minimum of 39 parking spaces for public parking for a period of not less than 10 years. And um, it must remain so until the developer uh, develops the public parking portion of the property for residential use. And if they are ever to sell it, the village has the first right of refusal and the opportunity to buy that land for a dollar. Um, at all times, the village will uh, do snow plowing on the lots, but the developer is responsible for the maintenance and repairs of the parking surface and the fixtures. And an item that uh, was added in here just at the 11th hour is a, and I think it's on page 10, but I haven't found it here, I'll have to find it here in a second. But if the developer, the, pro or the owner of the property, uh, whoever signs the development agreement essentially were ever to sell the property, uh, the village would have the right to, I guess, to approve that transaction and to make sure that the incentives go with the new owner. Essentially, we don't want somebody to uh, strike a deal with the village and then 10 years later they sell it to someone and move to California but they're still getting you know incentives from the village so we'd have provisions in there that would require the um, assignment to be approved by the village to make sure that the incentives stay with the property owner and those are uh, the highlights that uh, I have pulled out of here if uh, we have plenty of time. <laughs> if anyone has any questions or we want to ask Katie questions since she's here, uh, now's the time to do so. I have a question on uh, page 9, section D, number 2. Um, so the remainder of the term of this agreement, which would be through 2039, mm -hmm. right? Unless and until the developer develops a public park parking portion of the property for residential use. What does that mean? So we talked about the possibility of them converting a portion of that lot over to townhomes after 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that's what that refers to there. So it gives them the option to convert that property over from parking to resi residential use. Mm -hmm. um, and we would lose those parking places. Correct. Yes. We'd lose parking, but we'd gain uh, housing. Well, we're not really losing parking because, I mean, that's not going to be public parking to begin with. Yes, it yeah, is. Yeah, it is. It's public I parking. Mean, okay. Legally, yes. Practically, no. A development of that size is going to hopefully utilize more than 39 spaces each day or it's not going to stay in business very long, right? Well, the, the trick is, Trustee Fuller, is that it will be designated for public parking. Right. But I'm Whether or not everybody gets there at the right time from their development and uses every parking spot, I don't know. It's public, but it, it's not going to be 
taking, it's not going to be decreasing the burden from any other lots that we have in the village. It doesn't mean that everybody in those 39 parking places is in that business. They could be in Arth or they could be in. Right. In no, I get that. I just, I just want us to understand that we're subsidizing parking for that particular development. Well, they would, it's not as if it's, it's a general. But they're, par they're part of the event. business in the, here now. Right. So it's not like des there are designated parking spots for that development, but there will be 39 that will not be. Right. I know it's a relatively small issue, but it's been waved around as it's going to somehow help our parking issues in the village, and it clearly won't. No, but it will keep it from being keep excessively from exacerbated, you know. I mean, it's not creating a development without creating parking to go along with it, which we've had development here. We've had uh, restaurants go into places that, no longer, that did not have nighttime developments and they don't create parking but they have you right. know more people showing up at night it is what it is um, that's what we have that's our cycle now hope the cycle remains for a while because the future of gift shops and uh, uh, you know Ben Franklin is probably not too bright so we, we gotta in my opinion we have to strike while the iron's hot and I, I do appreciate at least that we do have a uh, parking lot that will be developed and will be even though theoretically it's for public parking, there's no reason why two or three people going to Fired Up couldn't get into there. You know, it's just one of those things. Well, that's the hope. Well, it's not necessarily the hope. It's just saying that on those nights where the restaurant may not be open or the restaurant is not busy on a Tuesday night, there may be open spots. Right. And it's going to be accessible if to park. there's talk of putting two restaurants in there, I don't think... 39 spots is going to even come that, close to cover that. That's probably true. I, I, yeah, and we no, hope I'm just saying, to, uh, let's not that, pretend that no, we're no. creating parking spaces. That being spaces. said, we hope to heck that they use a lot more than 39 spots because that right. means they're being successful. Right. That being said, we we want to have uh, you know businesses here that will bring people in. And if some of those people that come in have to park elsewhere along streets and walk, it's part of the charm and part of the curse. That's just what it is in Peoria Heights. Well, I guess the the way that I choose to look at it, and you know, Matt, your your point, we had discussed that early on that that whoa, 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 if this development is, is going to work, there's no way these spots are going to be available for the general public. You know, we identified that early on, and, and, and I yet, guess, and yet the general public's paying for them. <clears throat> just to make that clear. <laughs> Right, right. And and so I, I guess the way that, that I kind of am looking at it is that we're potentially adding four or five new businesses and not losing any net parking spots by doing so. Yeah. And uh, then we continue to scratch our heads on the parking issue, which uh, Matt and I have got a great idea for a stretch golf cart uh, to ferry people from point A to point B that uh, we're trying to... Uh, iron out the the details devil's always in the details that, uh, before we try and present that one thing to keep in mind though is that while well, you can say that the increase in the property taxes in a perfect world where we don't have to give out any incentives it was 1961 again and griff's burger bar came in here and all they want is good police uh, patrols and they want guys who clean the sidewalks and the and the uh, and the uh, streets well back in the day back then when uh, property taxes were very very low when uh, laborers and uh, craftsmen were working for four or five bucks an hour it was a whole different ball game today for for a whole bunch of reasons the cost to create a development is so high that we have to create incentives otherwise it doesn't happen do I do I any mean, of us not wish true? To, that is true. It, that what, is true. What you want to say is it the people won't the people that you want won't come here if, if you don't provide the incentives. That's what you're trying no, to say. No, here's what I'm saying that the only only outfit that steps up and wants to put a development there has to have these incentives. That's not true. That's not the case. Well, where are the other uh, what other proposals did we get? I'm saying we we put it out for proposal for about 3 or 4 weeks if I remember correctly. Yeah, but do you wait for a year? Do you wait for two? I, we waited for eight or nine years for the Paps property to turn into something fantastic, and I would have bet my life in the beginning that it would have. I'm just it saying didn't. we waited four weeks, and now we're we're basically putting the village in in limbo for 23 years. That's the expected payoff here. Here's so the here's, saying, here's the difference: is what we're talking. What I was going to complete, and I got carried away. I apologize. But what I'm saying is that the general public, while you can say that the increase that this development creates in taxes 
is public money. That being said, right now, the, the, what that property has in taxes will continue to go in as normal. Okay. What is paying for the parking lot, what is paying for the development are the, uh, the monies that are going to be generated by this development. So the, the increase in the sales tax, the increase in the, in the uh, BDD, and the increase in the property tax, because this development is being put in, that's what's paying for it. We're not saying, okay, here, we're going to take $200,000 out of the general fund every year to pay for it. It's being paid for by the increase that this development will create. But what I don't like, and what you explained exactly right there is, is correct, but what I don't like is we have a two-tiered system where if you're somehow politically connected, you don't have to pay real estate tax, property tax, and sales tax. I think that's terrible. I don't know why some people, some businesses in the village have to pay property tax and some don't. Why people, middle class people, going to work every day, they have to pay property tax. But a financial advisory firm... They, they all pay property taxes. Yeah, but they're getting it as a rebate. For cost so they're incurred, not paying right. it. So they're not paying towards the fire truck that we need. They're not paying towards the roads that we need. They're not paying towards the water. But they're generating the sales tax to help. Which we're not getting for seven years. Correct. So I'm saying I don't know why. Who who picks the in crowd and who picks the out crowd? Who picks who doesn't have to pay taxes and who does? Well, if, number one, it's in a tiff, which is legal, and it's you, hardly not, look. You can argue all point. you want to, but I, no. It's in a TIF. Yeah. Those options are available because it's identifying areas that without that TIF and without those incentives, the likelihood is you're not going to get a development there that you want. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's now, hold it. Here, uh, let me add. I'm not willing to you, pay. You, you can put something else into that building that doesn't generate sales tax revenue, and you can say, oh, great, we got development, but it's not going to pay for the bills later on. What, what I'm saying is what the whole thing that you can say about a TIF or anything regarding this development here. What you're doing is you're buying a 23-year annuity that you're not having to pay for. And after 23 years, we're hoping all, this, all of the uh, property tax after the 28 years is going to be going in to the coffers. The, after seven years, we'll start realizing sales tax revenues that, believe me, without doing this, we're not going to get there. Somebody's paying for it, I guarantee you that, and it's the people of the Heights. Okay? No, the and, people and the, who are the, paying the for problem. it are the developers by what they, what they create in an increase in, in what's going to be happening there that wouldn't be happening with an empty Amico building. The second problem is that it'd be, it'd be one thing if we abated the property taxes of a uh, Caterpillar factory or some business that's going to come in here and provide a lot of jobs. This is a financial advisory firm, the name of which I don't even know because we haven't been given to us. Have you seen the stock market? These guys don't need our help, okay? I mean, we, we don't need to be subsidizing a financial advisory firm that's, number one, not going to be providing local jobs, and number two, provides no sales tax to begin with, not that I'm aware of. Well, so, the, I mean, the is, development likely will taking, be creating so local taking, jobs legitimate economic development tools and applying them in the exact wrong circumstance. We don't need to be subsidizing upscale restaurants and financial firms. We, if anything, we should subsidize job, places that provide jobs. Well, welcome to Illinois 2016. The, the manufacturing base has been blown up here for about 30 years. So if, if, you're, if you're waiting around for the widget factory to open up there and create 60 good union jobs, you've got a long wait. Do, do I wish we could have that again? Oh, yeah, yeah, especially when I see my son come out with a business administration degree and not being able to find anything when 40 years ago all you had to do was breathe and you had a real good job here. Well, no, that's that. the way it is. I understand. And that, that being said, this, these jobs here, while they're service area jobs, they will be jobs. They will be creating jobs. The financial planner, I don't know, but I can tell you what, the restaurant or two restaurants or a restaurant and a, and a uh, shop of some kind or another will be creating the likelihood local jobs. The one thing we have, well, one of the many things we have going for the Heights is our restaurant industry. How you mess that up is subsidizing more restaurants to come locate in the village. If we're providing incentives for restaurants to come in, that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. Now, hold on, you're flying in the face of what you uh, said to me before when I said, you know, I don't want to keep handing out liquor licenses over and over and over. Yeah, what did you say no, to no, me? No, no, no. What did you say to me then? I'll, I'll explain it again because apparently you didn't understand. If a person, if an entrepreneur wants to open up a restaurant of their own volition, uh -huh. 
by all means, let's give them a liquor license. But what I'm saying is we shouldn't, as a village, be subsidizing and investing in those restaurants that are going to then increase the supply unnaturally of restaurants in the village. If somebody wants to come in because they think there's a market that they want to tap, great, fine. But we shouldn't be the ones deciding who it is that comes in the village and opens up a restaurant. As far as I know right now, nobody on the board or the administrator or me or the village clerk has, uh, has a background in assessing what is too much restaurant and what isn't. All we know is that there are people who are saying that they are willing to invest a lot of money get a lot of incentives, I agree, but they're investing here to create a restaurant, possibly two. Though these people are willing to do that. They want to do that. Right, it's about a $4 million project. They're putting up $400,000 in equity. The village taxpayers are taking care of the rest, for the most part. But again, the village taxpayers are not paying out of general fund. It's from a new but, money that we don't have right now. But they are because in five years, when a water main breaks and we need to raise property taxes to fix it, or when, you know, whatever happens, we need to consolidate the uh, police system or fire trucks, whatever, and we raise property taxes on people, who's not paying it? They're going to be paying their water bills. That's where they pay for their, uh, the uh, maintenance fees of the water. Um, you know how little we get from property tax might pay for a, a policeman and a half. I'm saying so their, their abatement for Peoria Heights, for the village of Peoria Heights, their abatement means virtually nothing. What it will be important is the sales tax revenue they will be producing in seven years, which does pay for a police force, which does pay for our street department, which does pay for uh, the f new fire truck. They will be creating that. We wouldn't have it otherwise. But it's the principle that the village residents have to do it but a financial advisory firm and an upscale restaurant don't have to do it. Principal, it doesn't matter the amount of money. It's I, I admire your, your sticking to your principles, but principles so far have not paid for a single fire truck. We have to do what is necessary now to protect the future. That's my opinion. We have to do, and do I like it like this? No. Does anybody like it like this? No. It's the nature of the beast. Now, if you can, we can stand here and say, well, we're not going to, by golly, we're not going to take part in this. We like that empty amical gas station. We can go ahead and have that attitude and wait a year, two years, three years, four years. I don't know. Maybe we'll get a, you know, a, a plumbing warehouse to open up there. But in the end, what we're trying to do is, is, is attract businesses that, unfortunately, we do have to give a lot of incentives to to bring in. That's what it is. But the beauty of it is that in seven years, we'll begin to see you know, the sales tax revenue coming out of that, the BDD revenue coming out of that, and that in 28 years, there will be a sizable increase in the money coming in to the property taxes for all the other surrounding bodies. Well, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of got that idea. Yeah. <laughs> and but you know what, a good If I can ask you a question, on, in the development agreement, in the preamble section, or part two, it says, this project is expected to create or retain opportunities within the village. Do we have an idea how many jobs it's, it's expected to create or retain? Okay. Do you? Okay. I don't have it right on the top oh. of my hand, but we did put a, an estimate in regards to the offices that would, uh, the one employees that would just put on that. And then also, okay, we don't have a gut that we could put together um, for the first world businesses. Okay. But those, I mean, are jobs. And when you look at, um, in terms of your economics, of your housing market specifically, um, and, and more so 70% of your housing market, I mean, those are jobs that will be created for those people living, you know, within that demographic of a house range. Any other uh, board members have any comments, questions? Well, I would throw it open to the public then if anybody would like to come up to the village lectern and give us your feedback on anything we've discussed. All right, seeing none then, uh, need a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. I have a motion to adjourn the special meeting, second. Second. Second from Trustee Cumming. Motion from Trustee Reichert. Uh, all those in favor of adjourning the Board of Trustees meeting special hearing at this time, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please say no. Thank you. The ayes have it. Meeting is now adjourned, but please stick around because the uh, matinee is coming up, our Board of Trustees regular meeting in just a few minutes.